from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome, my name is Lou Byard. I'm a D.C. writer and a regular reviewer for the Washington Post. And on behalf of the Post, I want to welcome you to the National Book Festival. We've got a great lineup of authors for you today. And um, this is one of, the, one, of the better, one of the best ones coming up just now. Okay, okay, good. Um, anyway, this is how one writer begins. As a child of the 1970s, lying on the living room carpet in an apartment on Manhattan's Upper East Side, helplessly watching horror movies of varying quality and of every subgenre, splatter, sci-fi, vampire, Satanist, and yet zombie movies, decidedly zombie movies. Is it any wonder that such a boy should grow up to write a zombie novel one day called Zone One? It shows what happens when a plague of the walking dead visits Manhattan. Smart and brutal, and in the words of book list, covertly sensitive. It's the book we might have predicted from such a child. But everything else that came before, the four novels and the essay collection, they smack more of mystery than horror. Where did all these ideas come from? All these protagonists, elevator inspectors, and nomenclature consultants, and a legendary steel driver and a prep school student fleeing to Hamptons. And how to explain the unfazed eloquence and the wit, which surges up when you least expect it. Here's a recent piece of sports reportage. It's safe to say that the Olympic torch, carried over 8,000 miles by as many souls, by the young and the old, by the lonely and the loved, by the faithful and the faithless, from Cornwall to Carlisle to Chipping Camden, is a germ factory. Should a literary novelist be this amusing, or so prodigally gifted, I leave it to you. And in the same breath, I ask you to please welcome Mr. Colson Whitehead. Howdy, thanks for a lovely introduction. Um, it's great to be here. Last time I was here, uh, I guess two years ago, I had 25 minutes and the Q&A went long and I felt really bad. So this time I'm going to read for two minutes and have a 23 minute Q&A. Um, I'd like to share work in progress whenever I can, so um, I'm going to read some new stuff. Um, I, re I realized a couple of years ago that there comes a time in every writer's life when it is time to edit an anthology. So a year and a half ago, I started assembling an anthology on the writer's craft. I'm calling it How to Write and the Art of Writing. Writers writing about writing. Um, the idea is simple. Today's best writers on the topic of their choice, or writers writing about writing. One of the first people to get back to me uh, when I announced this project was Jim Phillips, who contributed the following wonderful essay I'll share with you, How to Write. Jim Phillips, of course, is the author of several works of fiction, including the novels Can't Get There From Here, You Gotta Know When to Fold Them, and the award-winning colloquial phrase I will use as a title. Last year, he published the acclaimed work of cultural history, Ding Dang Dong, the true story of Frere Jaca, methamphetamine, and chronic insomnia. So this is his piece, How to Write. The art of writing can be reduced to a few simple rules. I share them with you now. Number one, show and tell. Most people say show, don't tell, but I stand by show and tell. Because when writers put their work out there, they're like kids bringing their broken unicorns and chewed up teddy bears to class in the sad hope that someone else will love them as much as they do. And what do you have for us today, Marcy? A penetrating psychological study of a young med student who receives disturbing news from a former lover. How marvelous, have a juice box. <laughs> and you, Timmy, what are you holding there behind your back? It's a Calvino-esque romp through an unnamed metropolis, much like New York, narrated by an armadillo. <laughs> Such an imagination. Have a juice box. 
show and tell, followed by a good nap. Rule number two, don't go searching for your subject. Let your subject find you. You can't rush inspiration. How do you think Truman Capote came to in cold blood? It was just an ordinary day, and he picked up the newspaper to read his horoscope, and it was right there, fate. Whether it's a harrowing account of a multiple homicide, a botched Everest expedition, or a family of colorful singers trying to escape from Austria when the Nazis invade, you can't force it. Once your subject finds you, it's like falling in love. It will be your constant companion, shadowing you, peeping in your windows, calling you at all hours of the night to leave messages like, only you understand me. Your ideal subject should be like a stalker with limitless resources. He's in your apartment pawing your stuff when you're not around, using your toothbrush, and cutting out all the really good synonyms from the thesaurus. Don't be afraid, you have a bestseller on your hands. Rule number three, write what you know. Saul Bella once said, fiction is a higher biography. In other words, fiction is payback on those who have wronged you. When people read my two books, my gym teacher was an abusive bully and she called them Brussels sprouts, a survivor's tale. They're often surprised when I tell them that there's an autobiographical element to them. Therein lies the art, I say. How do you make that which is your everyday into the stuff of art? Listen to this. Listen to your heart. Ask your heart, is it true? And if it is, let it be. Once the lawyers sign off on it, you're good to go. <laughs> Rule number four, never use three words when one will do. Be concise. Don't fall in love with the gentle trilling of your mellifluous sentences. Learn how to kill your darlings, as they say. I'm reminded of the famous editor-author interaction between Gordon Lish and Raymond Carver when they're working on Ray Carver's celebrated short story, those life preservers are just for show. Often considered the high watermark of so-called dirty realism. You recall the climax uh, when the two drunken fishermen try to calm each other after their dinghy springs a leak. In the original last line to the story, Matt, the salty old part-time insurance agent, reassures his young charge as they cling to the beer cooler. We'll get help once we hit land, I'm sure of it. No more big waves, no more sharks. We'll be safe once again, we'll be home. If you visit the Lilly Library at the University of Indiana and look at Gordon Lish's papers, you'll see how, with but a few death strokes, uh, the editor pared that down to create the now legendary ending, Help Land Shark. <laughs> It wasn't what Ray Carver intended, but few could argue that it was not shorter. <laughs> Rule number five, keep a dream diary. Rule number six, <laughs> what's not said is as important as what is said. In many classic short stories, the real action occurs in the silences. Try to keep all the good stuff off the page. Some real-world practice might help. The next time your partner comes home, ignore his or her existence for 30 minutes, and then blurt out, this is it, and drive the car onto the neighbor's lawn. <laughs> when your child approaches at bedtime, squeeze their shoulder meaningfully, and um, uh, if you're a woman, smear your lipstick across your face with your back of the wrist, or if you're a man, weep violently until they say, it's okay, Dan. Drink out of a chipped mug, a, a souvenir from a family vacation or weekend getaway in better times. One that can trigger a two-paragraph compare-contrast description later on. It's a bit like method acting, but you'll get the hang of it. Something let this thought guide your every word and gesture. Something is wrong. Can you guess what it is? If you're going for something a little more pomo, repeat the above, but with fish. Rule number seven, writer's block is a tool. Use it wisely. When asked why you haven't produced anything lately, just say, I'm blocked. Since most people think that writing is some mystical process where characters talk to you and you can hear their voices in your head, 
Being blocked is the perfect cover for when you just don't feel like working. The gods of creativity bless you, they forsake you, it's out of your hands and whatnot. Writer's block is like, we couldn't get a babysitter, or I ate some bad shrimp, an excuse that always gets a pass. But don't overdo it. In the same way the babysitter bit loses credibility when your kids are off in grad school, there's an expiration date. After 20 years, you might want to mix it up a bit. Throw in a Ralph Ellisonian, oops, my house caught fire and burnt up my opus. The specifics don't matter. The important thing is to figure out what works for you. Rule number eight is secret. Rule number nine. <laughs> rule number nine, have adventures. The heavyweight mode was in ascendancy for decades until it was eclipsed by trendy, fabulous exercises. The pendulum is swinging back, though, and it's gonna knock these effete eggheads right out of their Aeron chairs. Keep ahead of the curve. Get out and see the world. It's not gonna kill you to butch it up for once. Book passage on a tramp steamer. Rustle up some dysentery. It's worth it for the fever dreams alone. Lose a kidney in a knife fight. You'll be glad you did. Rule number 10, revise, revise, revise. I cannot stress this enough. Revision is when you do what you should have done the first time, but didn't. It's like washing the dishes two days later instead of right after you finish eating. Get that draft counter going. Remove a comma, and then print out another copy. That's another draft right there. <laughs> do that enough times, and you can really get those numbers up which will come in handy if someone challenges you to a draft off. When a referee blows the whistle, your opponent goes 26 drafts, and you must out with 317 and send them to the mat. Finally, rule number 11. There are no rules. If everyone jumped off a bridge, would you do it too? No. There are no rules except the ones you learned during your show and tell days. Have fun. If they don't want to be friends with you, they're not worth being friends with. And most of all, just be yourself. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I should probably read from Zone 1. Uh, my book just came out uh, last year in paperback this summer. Um, it's about zombies, so it's my second autobiographical book in a row. <laughs> so I'm going to start my reading with the first page. <clears throat> he always wanted to live in New York. You know, just seeing those words reminds me of the day when I wrote that sentence three years ago. It's always exciting when you start a new book. It's a time of optimism, of excitement. You're excited, you convince yourself, this book is gonna be great, I'm gonna get it right, I'm not gonna fuck it up like I did last time, and all those other times. And then you sit down and write that first magical day, and you have your notebooks and all your little jottings arrayed around you on your desk, and you look at the blank page, and you remember that writing a book is one of the shittiest jobs in the world. <laughs> Why are you putting yourself through this agony? For what? Everybody's gonna hate it like they always do. If you actually remembered how horrible it is to write a book, you would never start a second one. It's like having a baby. Um, I know some people don't like it when you compare the miracle of childbirth with uh, the creative process, but I think there's definitely some overlap between the two, um, if only in terms of sheer agony. Obviously, I've never passed a human baby through my pee-pee hole, but I figure it must hurt a lot. Because a human baby is like this big when it comes out. So it must hurt. And yet some women have two, three, four, five babies. You have to forget how much it hurts or else you never do it again. Um, okay. I'm going to start back to my reading. <laughs> you guys pay a lot of money. You deserve a proper reading from the zone one. I'm going to take it from the top again. He always 
wanted to live in New York. And once again, I find myself distracted <laughs> by what a strange, strange thing it is to write a book. Um, I'm not sure why I changed things up with Zone 1. Uh, it was the first time I wrote a whole book without showing anybody a single word. Uh, it was just me in my bunker. Maybe I was trying to recreate some of the atmosphere of the book. Uh, the psychology of the characters were alone, not knowing if they're going to make it to the end. Usually, um, I can get through the first third of the book before I have to share it with somebody else. Uh, the first hundred pages or first third, just to get a reality check that I'm not insane. Um, I'm writing a book about elevator inspectors, can you check it out? Just tell me I'm not crazy. And then, if I get a little validation, I can continue to the end. Um, with Sag Harbor, the book I wrote before Zone 1, uh, it was a very personal book, uh, and I was having all sorts of weird anxieties about whether I could pull it off. I see postmodernist experiments with human emotions. Um, I wasn't used to having myself out there so much, so each time I finished a chapter, I would show it to um, my agent. Uh, the book takes place in the 1980s. There's a lot of 80s pop culture in the book. And my agent is British, so I figured she'd be a good person to try sections out on, to see if I'm using the pop culture correctly, if you know, people get the references, even if you don't know what a member's only jacket is. Um, so each time I finish a chapter, I would send it along with some YouTube videos, uh, like music videos, or uh, new co commercials. That's the part of Sag Harbor. The opening of the Cosby Show, the opening credits, because the Cosby Show is a part of Sag Harbor. Um, I remember I sent her a video for The Message by Grandmaster Flash in The Furious Five, which is full of bombed out Harlem streets and rubble, and she was very excited because that's what she thought New York looked like when she moved here, and um, by then it had been cleaned up. So, um, you have to pick your readings, your readers, according to the strengths and weaknesses. Some people are good at structure, some people are good at line editing, uh, nonfiction. And you can't use the same person over and over again because uh, they get sick of it. Because no one wants to read your unedited 500 page manuscript. Um, I remember when I, I was writing that part, I sent it to someone who read a lot of my earlier work, and um, she was taking her time getting back to me. And I was sort of freaking out because the book was so personal, and um, weeks went by and months, and then finally I was like, um, Have you read it? And she said, yes. And I was like, well, what do you think? And she was like, I think I like the, the main character of Lila May in your first book better. Uh, and I said, you know this character is basically me, right? And she was like, yeah. Um, so I said, you know that we're married, right? And she was like, that's what makes us so awkward. <laughs> um, I need to get personal there. I'm going to start reading from the top. The book is called its own one. Um, first sentence. He always wanted to live in New York. Have I actually said what the book's about? Uh, I know I mentioned zombies. Um, uh, the Wise Zombies, Colson, uh, who always had like, a neurotic hole in my consciousness ever since I was a little kid. I had very progressive parents, so that meant I used to watch a lot of horror movies and inappropriate movies when I was very young. I remember um, when I was 10, A Clockwork Orange came on HBO, and we all, my whole family watched it together. It was like family night. <laughs> and um, I asked my mom, Mommy, what are those men doing to that woman? And she was like, it's a comment on society, shh. Um, <laughs> that was my introduction to Stanley Kubrick. And the next year, when I was 11, I saw Dawn of the Dead, which was rated X for excessive gore. And pretty much right after that, I started having zombie anxiety dreams. And I had them for decades, like once a month. Um, some people have anxiety dreams about leaving their notebook in a, in a cab on the day of the big presentation, or they're late for an exam. Uh, in a class, they didn't know they enrolled in. I always had zombie anxiety dreams, whether fast or slow, I'm alone or with a, a group of human survivors. And depending on what's going on in my life, I escape 
or, um, uh, or don't. So about three years ago, it was uh, July 4th, and I was having some, some house guests out in Long Island at my, my aunt's house I, I rent. And I woke up, and um, I heard them laughing and singing. And the only thing I could think was, can you please leave? Um, I probably shouldn't have had house guests. Uh, I was going through some, some things. I, uh, um, my father passed away. Uh, I was starting to suspect I might get divorced. It was little things like moving out and getting a divorce lawyer that tipped me off. Uh, so I probably should not have been a host. And I, I woke up and I heard my friends' voices and I wanted them to go. Um, the walls in this house are very thin. It's like a, a no-sex house. So I always try to make that clear um, before we have a holiday weekend. Uh, the guest room is made up. Can you bring some organic greens? The no-sex house. We'll see you on Friday. Um, so instead of going down to see my friend, I just stayed in bed and willed myself back to sleep. And um, I had a dream. Uh, in, in my dream, I was living in a, an apartment in Manhattan. That's how I knew it was a dream. Um, uh, a nightmare, in fact. And um, uh, I wanted to go out into the living room, but I had this thought, I didn't know if they had swept the zombies out yet. Um, and then I woke up, and I thought that's a real logistical concern. After the apocalypse, you know, it's winding down, the zombies are drying off, but I had to get rid of the stragglers. They sort of hang around like bad house guests. And um, I started working on the book that day. And it was the first time I got a book from a dream. Usually you have a dream, and you're like half awake, you write, the, write it down. Um, it's like, that's a good idea. Then you look at it the next day, and it's like, sex with my mother, that's not a novel. Um, but this time I got a book out of a dream and I was very excited. So, the book is called Zone One. Uh, the first sentence is, He always wanted to live in New York. But ultimately, to be truthful, what we did first find in my book makes me think of is, what's next? You have to keep moving, trying different forms, uh, pushing yourself. And I guess right now I'm, I'm sort of torn between two ideas. Uh, uh, the first one I'll just share with you is a real departure for me. Uh, it's a, a love story set on the eve of the Russian Revolution. There are a lot of white people in it. So for research, I'm watching a lot of Golden Girls. Um, <laughs> Got a box set, we'll see how it goes. Um, and then the other idea is a little more obvious, it's science fiction, uh, which I think could be fun, science fiction, but uh, science fiction specifically set in the world of Star Wars. Um, I know George Lucas is really protective of his intellectual property, um, but if you ask me, copyright is an outmoded concept like being happy or <laughs> falling in love. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of the Star Wars films have a lot of questions that are unanswered, and I think I could be helpful. Um, for example, in Star Wars, the first Star Wars, uh, they have the Death Stars, the Death Star, which is like a weapon the size of a moon. And then uh, they have lightsabers, which are literally swords made out of laser. And they have hyperspace, faster than light drive, that can take you um, to the other side of the universe in half a second. And yet, R2-D2 can't get a fucking voice box. Um, he's a, the smartest character in all the movies and he can't speak. It's, it's a tragedy. Um, it's not a technological issue. Um, Luke Skywalker gets his hand cut off, gets a robot hand. Uh, Darth Vader falls into the volcano, he gets a whole new robot body. Uh, the Death Star gets destroyed, they make a new Death Star the size of a whole planet this time. And then R2-D2 cannot speak. C-3PO has a voice box. Uh, he's running in his mouth all the time. Like when they land on Tatooine, the uh, desert planet, before they get picked up by the Jawas, if you remember our uh, sort of like space crackheads. Um, <laughs> They, they find stolen property and try to sell it. I mean, if you ask them where they got it, they're all further, like, 
Where did you get this land speeder? Uh, it's a little truck, it's my aunt. Uh, it's an, um... So, well, before they get picked up by the space packets, um, C-3PO and R2-D2 are wandering the desert, and C-3PO says, I dare say the desert sands are burning my feet. And R2-D2 goes, But you know, if he could speak, he'd say, he'd be, he's actually saying, Princess Leia's been kidnapped. Um, I got a blueprint on my chest of the Death Star. Darth Vader's trying to destroy the universe. And this silly motherfucker is like, the sand is burning my feet. So, I'm gonna pick, I'm pick between those two projects, and I guess I'm out of time. So, uh, I, I can't read from someone this time. But thanks so much for having me, and thank you guys for coming out. I'd love to answer, answer them as a microphone. And thank you so much. Or advice for me. Uh, are these new pants from Hill Group? How do you like them? Are they alright? Pants. I really like your pants. Um, very autumnal. Um, I wanted to ask about the, uh, the job of Mark Spitz in Zone 1, which I was a big fan of. I know you're very active on Twitter, and I think you're hilarious on Twitter. And his job is sort of this guy who, as I understood it, sits on Twitter and messages um, people about Starbucks coffee. Do they like their Starbucks experience? And here's a free gift card if you didn't like it. So would you be able to talk a bit about what your thinking was behind that? Um, yeah. Sure. I mean, I wanted a, um, a really contemporary job. For me, the book takes place in maybe like 2018. It's not because we said, because we say it, but... I wanted it to take place in the future. And I am on, on Twitter a lot, and um, occasionally if you make a joke about a brand, you know, someone from the, the um, Red Lion uh, Twitter account will say like, that bugs, what happened, what? you know, we need to be back to the next company next day or whatever. So it seemed, um, uh, so I needed a job for my protagonist uh, that would, would be really current and also talk about alienation. And so his job is to, is to make force fake connections on, onto strangers. So if you're on Twitter or Facebook, you mention, oh, I can use a cup of coffee, he's eavesdropping, he'll send you a message saying, well, why don't you try our new double latte, you know, blah, 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 uh, here's a coupon. And that's his job, just sort of uh, uh, create these fake interactions. And so I was trying to think of what, in, in our contemporary world, makes us zombie-like. We're not zombies, uh, generally. But where, where in our daily lives are we sort of less than human? Where are we cut off from other people? And it seemed that uh, this kind of job as uh, a social media liaison to the corporations spoke to a certain kind of uh, alienation where you think you have a connection and maybe you don't. And so then, you know, the people I talk to on Twitter talk to me, uh, we're Twitter friends, but I have no idea like, what they look like or who they are. But you feel you know them, um, and yet, uh, they could be serial killers or whatever, you have no idea. So it seemed like that was a good job for my protagonist. Thanks. I'm not a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a librarian and I'm a huge fan of your books and most books, actually. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, yours are more. No, but, thanks. Uh, <laughs> You know, if someone you know buys or writes that do audiobook. Uh, I feel bad, you know, for them sometimes. Like I'm glad he did a good job. I, I read the audiobook of Colossus of New York, uh, and uh, I would get like, stuck on words. I had to do like, ten takes of the word like deluge, 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 deluge. and uh, so like, an engineer going like deluge, 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 and it's, it's terrible. So I feel really feel for them. And then 
definitely like with books from like John Henry Davis, which has really sort of long, intricate sentences. But I, I, I read stuff in my book uh, that's good for reading, sort of generally humorous parts. And like, there are some, some crazy ass adjectives I use. I have no idea how to pronounce. I learned that early. Um, and so I feel for them. I'm glad, you know, it's, it is a real task. So I'm glad they can pull it off. And I'm definitely in their debt. Howdy. I really liked your series from the World Series of Poker on uh, Grantland. Can you like talk about that and experience a little bit? Because I thought that was awesome. Sure. Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot of fun. Lot of fun. Looking back, it was one. Uh, I think it's one of the peak experiences of my life. And I've been sort of depressed ever since uh, I went there. Uh, I didn't want to go. I um, I don't really write about sports. Uh, but I got this call from Grantland. It's a new band that was just starting out. It's a uh, web magazine. Funded by ESPN, and they're like, you want to write about sports? And I was like, no, I hate sports. And they're like, uh, well, your agent said you play poker. You want to cover the world through the poker? And I was like, you know, Las Vegas is so hot. I don't know, ten days. And they're like, what if they staked you and you played in the world series? And I was like, yes. So um, I only really play like five dollar buy-in poker, like home games that are really mellow. So I got a poker coach uh, to you know bring me up. I got a physical coach to get me into shape for sitting motionless for 12 hours a day. Um, and then I went to the World Series of Poker and wrote about it, and it was great. Since I, 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 my fee was like the entrance fee, so I was getting paid for it. If I'd been paid, if I was writing it for money, I probably would have been 10 pages. Since I was doing it for free, it ended up being like 70 pages. It's like my novelist mentality. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff like, I didn't put into it, and my next book is going to be an expansion of that into like a short book. So that's what I'm working on now, doing uh, a lot of um, getting a lot, a lot of stuff that, that didn't fit into that 70 page article. So, right, thanks. Hi, and uh, if that's it, thanks so much. Hope you enjoy the rest of the day. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.